Two of the best questions a person or a church could ask are, God, who do you want me to be? And God, what do you want me to do? I mean, those are the two questions, right? Who do you want me to be? And what do you want me to do? These weeks, we're looking at the future of our church. What does God want us to do? Who does he want us to be? And, and uh, well, it's, we're couching it in this phrase that centers on the word real. And what we're saying is that, I think it's next slide there, is that when it comes to what God wants us to do, that we first have to start with who God wants us to be. And we're saying that God wants us to be real people with real faith. And then is the doing, making real impact. And so the first three weeks were the question, what or who do you want me to be? And we've talked about how important it is to God, and this escapes a lot of Christians, but how important it is to God that we be in reality and be real, be genuine and honest about who we are. That is, that we're not perfect, we're a work in process, uh, we need the help of God and others. God simply can't do great things through self-sufficient and arrogant people. In the book of James, he says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So when we started asking the question, what do you want us to do? We started by saying, really, we got to back up. We got to say, who do you want us to be? Because for God to do something in us big, he needs to have people who admit that we can't do it on our own. We need him and we need others for life. And then the last two weeks, we've been more on this who do you want us to be idea by talking about the kind of faith God wants us to have, a faith that it's consistent in all the areas of our life and a faith that's willing to, to take risks. So this is where we've been for the last three weeks. Who do you want us to be? Today and next week, we're going to try to unpack the question, what do you want us to do? This is the practical to-do list. And over the next handful of years, we're going to pour a lot of focused energy and time and sacrifice and money into three things that the Bible is very clear about. Help poor people, tell others about Jesus, and start churches. That's straight out of the Bible, but that's, uh, we'll do a, a lot of other things with kids' ministry and youth ministry and adults and men's and women's and all kinds of things. But three things that we believe God is calling us to throw a lot of time and energy and focus into are these three. Help the poor, tell your family and friends and neighbors about Jesus, and somehow we got to connect with church planting. Now, I picked up just a little bit of uncertainty. I mean, no one's angry, no one's like arguing against this and being loud or in any way negative. It's just that there's some uncertainty that I'm picking up on the church planting idea. As in, why are we locked into that? I mean, everyone knows we, the church should help the poor. And everyone knows that every church should be telling others about Jesus. But here's the legitimate question. Should every church plant a church. I mean, why should First MB engage in actually sending off a few people and they start a church? Why? Well, today I want to talk about church planting. Uh, I've decided ahead of time that I'm not going to try to convince you that it's the right thing. That's not my job. Um, I don't want to carry that burden. I, I will share some practical and biblical reasons that I think overwhelmingly point toward a heart of God for starting new churches. Um, so uh, we're going to start with a couple questions. And the first question is, why should we even consider as a church looking at the future, starting a new church in the Wichita area? Uh, the, the short answer says that more people accept Christ through new churches than established churches. We're an established church. We're 70 years old plus. Uh, a new church, a young church, uh, 
studies and, and surveys have shown overwhelmingly that this is true. More people accept Christ through church plants than through established churches. The second short answer to why we as a church should even consider the question, why should we plant a church, is because it will be good for us. Studies and surveys have shown that when a church takes this step of faith, God blesses them for it. Now, let's, let's go back to the first question, I mean the first part of that answer, and some statistics. Dozens of surveys and studies are out there that show that churches that have been in existence 15 years or less, that 60 to 80% of their attendance growth over those 15 years is from people who aren't connected with God or church. As opposed to churches that are, have been in existence for more than 15 years, that only 10 or 20% of their growth over that last, for us it would be 55, 60 years or whatever, uh, that our growth, only 10 or 20% come from unchurched or far from God people. Two live examples are not only us, but Lighthouse in South Wichita. This is a church plant that we have a very good relationship with. They've been in existence for between 8 and 10 years. And over the past 8 to 10 years, this 60 to 80% has proven true for them. Just as the statistics say. That 60 to 80% of their numerical growth are people who were disconnected from God, didn't know Jesus, were unchurched. Our church established, over the last eight and a half years, we've increased in our attendance by 400 people. But 90% plus of those 400 new people over the last eight years, I'm not talking the last... 70 years or whatever, but 90% have been from Christians who moved into Wichita, Christians who moved to the west side of Wichita, uh, Christians who hadn't been in church recently, and children or a crisis, and sometimes those are the same thing, brought them back to church, all right, or Christians from other churches, overwhelmingly 90 plus percent of these 400 and there's no apology for this we're glad you're all here but we are living proof of this statistic that if a church is in existence over 15 years they largely become ineffective in reaching unchurched people but if you're under 15 years you are pretty effective 60 to 80 percent of your growth is from unchurched the only reason I'm even entertaining the idea of us planting a church sometime is because there is a really, really good chance that that church plant over the next 15 years will see more people come to Christ than if we just kept growing. So if we send off 20 or 30 or 40 people and over the next 15 years, they, even if they grow to no more than 100 people, they will see more people accept Christ than if we grew by 100. The only reason we're even considering this is because it will fill heaven up a little more than if we didn't. Okay. Now, uh, a few verses here. Um, in Matthew 16, Jesus said that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not stand up against it. God gave three social institutions to the, church, to the, to the world. He gave the family, the church, and the government. And when the family does its job, and when the church does its job, and when the government does its job, that's about as smooth as this earth can spin this side of heaven. 
Jesus created the church as the agent through whom he would be taken to the world. He said, not even hell itself will stop the mission of me building my church to get me to the world. All throughout the New Testament, the 12 disciples and the different leaders of the church, all throughout the New Testament, all they did was start churches. They would travel through Israel and Turkey and Italy and Greece. And they just planted churches because they understood that Christ building his church was the way that the world would be reached. Just planted church after church after church. In Titus chapter 1, 5, Paul told Pastor Titus, he said, appoint elders in all the churches in every town. Strategically and biblically, the best way to reach people who do not yet believe in Jesus, is to start a new church. Just to keep starting new churches. A second reason that we ought to consider starting another church in Wichita is not only because more people will find Christ than if we didn't, but because it will be a blessing to us. Uh, Obviously, I've never given birth, but uh, Joan and I, as parents... (laughs) have birthed children, right? Uh, It's a a long nine-month process and not always comfortable, and the labor and delivery are not always fun. Okay, they're never fun. But there's always unspeakable joy at the other end, right? There's nothing like giving new life. And God overwhelmingly chooses to bless a church that goes through the effort you know, of pregnancy and giving birth and the hard work of, of sending off 20 or 30 or 40 people. God overwhelmingly ends up blessing that church by not only bringing new 40 people to replace the one, but giving them new life and energy and joy of being parents who see their children succeed. So that's the first question, and I'm not trying to convince you. I'm only saying that practically and biblically planting new churches is a good idea. The the second question is how might that look for us if it happened? And I'd like this next section of my sermon to have a little asterisk and you hold me, uh, don't hold me accountable for anything I say. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball Uh, I don't know how it will work, but I will be honest and transparent with you and share some of the things that we're thinking about. This is your church, and we're not trying to keep secrets. So uh, don't hold me to this because I don't know the future, but these are some things about how it might look if we did plant a church. Some people say, well, when would it happen? I say, I don't know, but let's say 2015. That... Um, In 2015, and this of course would come after lots of prayer and processing and all of that, we want you to own the vision, we don't want it just to be a leader idea, we want you to buy into it. I don't for a minute think that everyone in our church is going to be excited about church planting, but we need to have that prayer and processing. But perhaps at the end of 2014 or 15, uh, beginning of 15, we would hire a church planter. That would be part of our church process of doing that together. We would hire a church planter who would be on staff and come to our services for 9, 10, 11, 12 months, but he would be a part of our church. And over those first nine months, he would uh, begin to meet with people and have meetings and Together, somehow, we'd discern maybe five families. We wouldn't vote on them, but these would be five, maybe ten families. And family might be a single person. It might be a couple with, uh, with no kids or a couple with kids. So 
five families might be 15 people, it might be 20, with 10 families, it might be 40 or something, but we'd have this little group of people who said, we're on for this, we will leave First MB and we will start another church because we believe that we'll see more people saved if we do this than if we don't. During these nine months, these people that are kind of being raised up and, and the church planner will be out sharing their faith and we hope that there will be two, three, or four other families that will have come to believe in Jesus over these nine months. And, but, but that group would go off and start a church. Where would it be? Send me an address. I mean, honestly, we don't know. That's, you see, that's part of this process that we trust the Lord for. There would be some financial impl implications, of course. We'd work through this with the church. What I don't want us to get hung up on is the how. I want us to stay anchored to the why. Because if we do this with God's help and with his leading, and for the reason that Jesus came when he said, I came to find and save those who have lost their way, then the how will work itself out as we process that together. Um, that's the first half of my sermon, and I'd like to end with a story about a church that found its start in Philippi, Greece, in Acts chapter 16. Um, and I hope that out of this story you will... Trust God that if he were to bless this church with a church plant, that he will raise up people to be a part of that. That's what I hope you see. So Paul was a great missionary in the New Testament. Uh, everywhere he traveled in Israel and Turkey and uh, Greece and Italy, he started churches everywhere he could go. And so, well, in Acts 16, uh, I'm going to read quite a bit of this chapter. And if you're one who likes to follow along, grab a Bible and, and find Acts 16. But we're going to begin reading at verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi. That's the city where this church is planted a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. We're going to find out that this Greek word several days really means a period of time because it appears as if he's there for weeks or months. On the Sabbath, we, and there's a group that's traveling with Paul, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Philippi is called a leading city. Here it is in verse 12 or 13, a leading city. Uh, and if you studied church planting in the New Testament, you would see that one of the strategies is they start churches in the leading or significant city, believing that it will spread out from there. This was a Roman colony. It says that on the Sabbath, that's the holy day for the Jews, Paul went to the river expecting to find a, quote, place of prayer. Now, you could just keep reading, but there's something buried underneath this that we need to figure out. In this Roman colony where Philippi was, there weren't enough Jews to build and sustain a synagogue, a, a permanent church for the Jews. And the tradition, as odd as it might sound, is that they would build a temporary shelter. And it, it may be in our days it would be like a shelter at a park. You know, just the, the, the roof and, and the four poles and a, a couple of tables. That it was there. And they would often build one of those by a river. 
Now, I don't know what about a town that had some Jews, but not enough for to hold up a synagogue, but they didn't have a river. But here, so Paul arrives, knows full well that this city has very few Jews. They won't have a synagogue. He assumes that on the Sabbath they will have put together a little structure, and there's a prayer meeting down by the river, and he shows up at the river. Sure enough, there are some ladies there. Scholars believe that the ladies got there early to the prayer meeting, and the men hadn't arrived yet. But Paul sits down and he starts talking with these ladies, one of whom has a name that's given to us, Lydia. She was a businesswoman, a dealer of purple cloth. Purple cloth was a high-end product uh, for the wealthy, and Lydia appears to have been a wealthy slash successful businesswoman. Side note. In Luke chapter 8, I don't know if you remember that, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, it says there were a group of, of well-to-do women, financially, who supported Jesus and the 12 disciples for three years while they were unemployed and traveling around talking about Jesus. So, uh, this isn't the only example of women working, but here, uh, in, back to this story, is Lydia, this businesswoman, and apparently successful. Well, when Paul told her about Jesus, it says that God opened her heart. She already believed in God. She just didn't know about Jesus, but God opened her heart. And I assume over the next days, she, uh, she introduced Paul to her family. They talked. Her whole family accepted the Lord. They were all baptized. And so Lydia and her family were the first charter members or core group of this new church in Philippi. The story continues, verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, this is another week, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. The girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. So there is this slave girl. She has a dark spirit in her. And by the power of that dark spirit, she's able to tell the future. Her owners, she was a slave, earned a great deal of money. Her owners got a great deal of money from her. When she saw Paul, the darkness inside of her was compelled to announce the light that the darkness saw in Paul. That the devil inside of her was forced to say out loud that Jesus is Lord. This was not a happy voice. This was not a voice where she was hoping others would come to Jesus. This was the reluctant but can't be restrained voice that comes out of darkness when it's put in the presence of Jesus. And so this voice came out of her, probably snarling and angry. These are servants of the Most High God. They are telling you the way to be saved. It wasn't something that was positive. It was truth, but it was the darkness speaking out because of the light. Paul did not like this. It was not good. He was annoyed. This went on for several days until he finally turned and looked and he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to leave her. And the darkness fled. And this slave girl was, was set free. When her owners saw that their income stream was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them before the rulers 
And long story short, they were flogged and thrown in jail. Now we're not told what became of this slave girl set free. So I don't want to overstate it. It doesn't even say whether she believed in the Lord. She was set free in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I don't want to overstate it, but it's not unreasonable. And I do personally believe that this former slave girl was a second family to join this church plant in Philippi. So now, you have a businesswoman and a former fortune-telling slave girl. But there was one more family that God wanted to be a part of this church plant. Chapter 16, verse 23. After Paul and Silas had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. At about midnight, uh, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake, this is a miracle, that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He knows that they had really saved his life. And he, he then brought them out of the jail and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And so somehow there's some stuff in between the lines here of where they go and how long this takes. But at that hour when Paul shared Jesus with this jailer and his whole family, at that hour the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Immediately all, he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. In the next chapter, chapter 17, Paul heads off to another city to start another church. About seven years later, in the year 61 AD, Paul wrote a letter to this now seven-year-old church in Philippi. It's in our Bible. It's the book of Philippians. And yes, after seven years, they were alive and thriving. So when, when Jesus said that he would build his church and the gates of hell wouldn't stop the mission of taking Jesus to the world through the church. When Jesus said that, and Paul showed up in the Roman colony of Philippi, it wasn't by accident that he showed up at a river and a prayer meeting. Because Christ was building his church. And he was tapping a well-to-do businesswoman on her shoulder, saying, you're mine. Let's go build a church. Uh, it wasn't by coincidence or happenstance that this dark-spirited slave girl was forced to yell out in snarling words, these men are servants of the Most High God and they will tell you the way to be saved because, well, while Paul was annoyed, Christ was building his church. And hell itself, a dark-spirited slave girl, would not stop the mission. And when everything looked dark and Paul and Silas were thrown into the jail, 
What was Jesus doing? Building his church. Hell itself wouldn't stop that. And so he found a jailer. A businesswoman. A former fortune-telling slave girl. And a jailer. And a church is being built. I, I am not leading God. I want him to lead us. But in his time... And in his way, I am praying, and hope you will pray as well, that God will privilege our church to be a part of this mission that Jesus is on. And I have to believe if he could start a church in Philippi, Greece, with a businesswoman, a former slave girl, and a jailer, that he will find people in our family and tap them on their shoulders and say, I'm building my church. Let's go. It's in God's hands. It's in his timing and in his way. But I hope you'll pray that we would do everything we can that heaven might be a little more full and hell a little more empty because we were about starting churches. Let's pray. We want to be people who show mercy to the world around us, Father. Who believe that you're about changing the world and it's through the church. And that hell itself won't stop the mission. For whatever's ahead, we trust you. For what's around the bend that we can't say, see, we say we'll follow one step at a time. Father, I do believe that you've got great things in store for our church. And we'll continue to give lots of money to church planting and we'll help out Lighthouse and other young plants. But Father, if it's in your plan, we would be privileged if you would use us to show mercy to a world and start another church. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were here at the very beginning of the service,